start planning for your retirement. Plan now and make your golden years golden. Come, let's make it happen. Hello and welcome to part two of the three-part series on uh, retirement planning. The series is brought to you by uh, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank and the National Television Network. In part one, uh, we touched on making the transition from work to retirement. And in part two, uh, we will be getting into the nitty-gritty of things where we speak on estate planning, uh, maintaining property value, insurance, and NIC benefits. Uh, my name is Elijah Williams. I'm the moderator for today. I'm joined by uh, my three panelists. To my immediate right, Ms. Trudy Glasgow. She's an attorney at law. Uh, center stage, Mr. Linus Bernardin, who is a representative of the National Insurance Corporation. And uh, to the far end, we have uh, Mrs. Verna Henville, who is a representative from Nagico Insurance is limited. Good day to you guys. Right. Yeah. We can probably just um, go straight into the discussion. As I indicated um, in part one, we touched on um, you know, some of the ways that people could get themselves ready to make that transition um, from the workforce um, into retirement. Um, quite a few areas of discussion came up, but we want to zone in on some specific things. Uh, maybe we could start with you, Ms. Glasgow, um, from the standpoint of um, estate planning. Um, um, what is it like in, in your field um, when it comes to estate planning? Is that something that St. Lucians are very keen on, and, and what sort of advice could you provide them with? Well, thank you for having me. Um, well, in terms of estate planning, largely what we look at is wills, and we encourage persons to do wills as soon as possible. Uh, people tend to think that they should do it when they retire and it's actually a little late in the day at that point. You should have done a will well before then. But certainly if you're retiring and you haven't done a will, we would encourage you to go out and get a will. Now what is a will? A will is essentially a document that uh, the testator yourself is advising what you would like to be done to your, your assets after you pass away. So the will does not take effect until, until you, you've passed away, and that's a very important fact. Um, and so if you are of sound mind, uh, you're over eight, 18 or over, you should make a will, particularly if you have children and you have assets, it is important to make a will so you make provisions for what you would like to have done with your assets. Uh, we generally hear, uh, especially when it comes to kids, we, we, we hear the term a legitimate child. Um, could you probably shed some light on that? Because I think some people think it's just automatic um, that if you have a kid, especially if you acquire a child um, through marriage, that it's just automatic that if something happens to you that the, whatever assets that you have will probably be equally shared. What's, how does that work out? Okay, and this is why we talk about a will. A will will dictate exactly what happens to your your assets, for want of a better word. If it is that you don't, for whatever reason, get along with your children, you can leave it to your favorite <laughs> aunt or your cat. <laughs> and we have had persons who do that, or a, a dear friend of yours. Um, if you don't make a will, it means that you've died intestate, and that means that then uh, members of the family will go to court to decide what happens to your, your assets. Um, when you're talking about legitimate and illegitimate children, uh, this is a little more involved. Um, if it is that you're a single man or woman, there is a provision in the civil code which says that your children will inherit. Um, but that is, this is a little complicated because it depends. Did you get married subsequently? Did you get married and have other children? So all these ha things have to be looked at uh, before the, the courts will decide how your assets will be divided. Uh, is it I, I think people normally um, think that uh, if somebody is deceased, that automatically the spouse gets 
full control over everything? Is, is that in actuality what the case is? It's not exactly right. There are other, there are other deciding factors. But if you, let's say you are married and you pass away um, and you have children, um, your spouse is entitled to a share, entitled to a half share, and then your children are entitled to a half share. We're talking about if you haven't made a will. Right. Yeah. Remember, if you've made a will, you can leave everything to your spouse. And, and persons do that. Or you can leave everything to your children, leave out your spouse. It's up to you. But if you die without a will, um, the law then takes effect. Uh, in the civil code, it's from section 579, um, which talks about legitimate children, but also um, what the divisions will be. Um, so it's really important to consider what you would want because a will is something that you can change at any point. Right. And there are persons who have made more than one will in their lifetime. And it is the one that is the most recent that takes effect and the others can be ripped up to shreds. Mm -hmm. What about um, common law situations? How does um, the absence of a will affect the common law situation? Okay, again, if, if you are living with someone Again, the question becomes, do you have children? Do, don't you have children? Um, if in a situation where you don't have children, the common law spouse may be entitled to certain things if the parents are, have deceased. So if you've died and your parents are still there, your parents actually um, inherit. And this may not be your wish. You may like to leave something to your common law spouse. And if you have made provisions and had a will, then the law takes effect and that means that your parents actually uh, jump ahead of your common law spouse in that situation. Oh, very interesting. Um, um, you guys, you can feel free to join in. Yeah, to I, I the wanted discussion. to add also with uh, our medical insurance, we do not have a to, for you to bring a will, really, but on the enrollment form, if you have life insurance, there's a part where you have to complete who you want to leave the life amount. The beneficiaries. If it's your, yeah, if it's mm. your cut, as, <laughs> as Glasgow says, or if it's your common law spouse. Mm -hmm. So without this being completed, then you'll have to face the court mm -hmm. for a letter of administration for us to know exactly uh -huh. who that money goes to. In a scenario like that, Ms. Glasgow, yeah. does that form being filled out at the insurance company serve in effect as sort of a will for that allocation of your... No. A will is a, a separate document. It has to be in a prescribed form. Okay, so you can have a written will. You can actually go away and just write something and sign it. We would advise against that because your relatives can actually challenge that. Mm -hmm. So what you should do is go to a lawyer and the lawyer will put it in the correct form as prescribed by law mm -hmm. and ensure that there are actually two notaries present. It has to be registered. And it, has to be, it does not have to be registered, mm -hmm. but it has to be signed off by two notaries in your presence right. um, so that um, it is witnessed and actually each page is signed off as well. So it's, it's a very involved process. This is helpful because mm -hmm. when, um, uh, when you have life insurance, this is very, very helpful. Um, Ms. Henville mentioned uh, letters of administration. This is when you don't have a will. You do a probate if you have a will, mm -hmm. but you do letters of administration if, if you don't have a will. Mm -hmm. um, and the letters of administration means that you've gone to court and you would, this document would come forward as to what you would want to done with, with your life insurance. But what yeah. about other assets? Mm -hmm. right? What about other assets? What do you want to happen to that? You haven't made provision for that. So then that the court would make a decision based on, um, based on varying factors on what happens after that. Okay. Let's just assume someone is not of sound mind. Ah. What, ha what happens then? Wow. Okay. If someone is of, uh, not of sound mind, it depends on when that happened. Um, you have individuals, and you have to be very careful as an attorney because so I remembered early in my practice being called to a hospital where someone was on their, mm -hmm. sad to say, had, yeah, had a few days to live. And uh, my boss at the time took one look at the situation and said, we're leaving. We never engaged with him or anything like that because we didn't realize he was so dire. Right. But in speaking to the doctors, we realized that this is, this is beyond the pale and we cannot, he's not, of, uh, not of unsound mind is not the correct term here, but he's not capable. He's not capable mentally mm -hmm. to make a decision. He's under duress, some yeah, sort of duress. It, 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 yeah, he's, his, his he, death yeah, is imminent. Yeah, his death is imminent. So he, his decision-making factors are obscured here. So we yeah. can't do a will at this point. Now that is quite different to someone who may be ailing, maybe mm -hmm. an elderly person and so on, but is very sharp mentally and is not feeling well, maybe in bed for a few days or something, but very sharp, and you get advice. The doctor would then advise the lawyer, look, yes, 
she's, she's able to, and you can make that decision for yourself, that they're able to do the will because okay. uh, a will can be challenged and um, what can be challenged is your mental state at the time of doing the will. Mm -hmm. If you are mentally unsound after making the will, that's an entirely different matter and the will will stand. Mm -hmm. But if at the time you were doing the will, you're seen to be mentally sound, uh, you're, you're fine. Okay, we do for a short break. Uh, when we return, we'll have some more discussions on uh, the issue. Pamela, I noticed that you built your retaining wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. And uh, welcome back. If you just joining us, we are having a discussion on retirement planning. This is part two of a three-part series. And uh, joining me are my esteemed panelists to my immediate right, Mr. Trudy Glasgow, attorney at law, Mr. Linus Bernardin, who is center stage, representative of the National Insurance Corporation, and Mrs. Verna Henville, a representative of Nagico Insurance Limited. Uh, Mr. Bernardin, let's go to you. Um, the NIC, um, tell us from a standpoint of um, benefits what the NIC has in place um, for retirees. Good day, Elijah. Thanks for having me. Well, the first thing I'll say is you need to get ready for retirement. Retirement cannot just come and you're unaware that it's coming. So if I speak to a group of people, I'll tell them within five years of retirement, you should come down to the NIC to find out exactly what you're going to get because you need to know what the amount is so you can budget for it. So in preparation for retirement, that may be a good time to see if you can section off your house so you can rent a portion because whatever money that you're going to get from NIC, you need to bear in mind that it might not be able to pay your mortgage, right. that you are going to fall sick, that Lucilek, you got to pay them. You have to pay your phone bill and all of those commitments, these commitments must be met. So within five years of your retirement, you come down to any of our offices to find out exactly what your amount go is going to be. And once you have a pretty good idea what it's going to be, then you can start gauging whether you can take it at age 60, which is the minimum age at which you can take it, or the actual retirement age, which is 65. Bear in mind, however, that if you decided to take it at age 60, that your pension is going to be modified because the actual retirement age is 65. Why is it modified? Because we want you to work up until you are 65. Because the way the system operates is active workers are now paying pensions for those out there. And when that percentage or when that ratio begins to get closer and closer, it means that you're beginning to have a problem. It means we are unable to collect enough to pay current retirement expenditure. Okay. So we need you to stay in working as long as you can possibly work. However, if you decided to take it at age 60 or whenever you decide to take it, the minimum number of months that you require for retirement is 180. Now that doesn't have to be consecutive in any way. So you can have six, six in 2000, one in 1979, once together it comes up to 180, you become entitled to a minimum pension or a minimum percentage pension. So let's look at it in one of two ways. A minimum of, a, a minimum of an average is 40, which is, what, which is the minimum amount that you're going to get, or the maximum is 60 of an average. What that average is, is determined on the number of years that you've worked or the number of years that you've contributed, plus the size of your contribution. Right. So there's no minimum contribution as it is. So I have seen people 
come in with, say, a thousand. I remember working in customer service, and I saw a lady came in with what total contributions were a thousand three hundred dollars, but she had been getting a pension for a number of years because she worked she worked in places that the the money, whatever they were contributing, it wasn't big money, so to speak. Right. So twenty five cents can be a month. Five hundred dollars can be a month. However, together they create the 180, which is the minimum required. Once you have that, you become entitled to your pension. And you will get that for as long as you live. If there's one thing that's guaranteed, and ICE is going to pay you for as long as you live. Well, let me throw a question at you. Mm. Um, the perception is that your pensions will be calculated um, on your last few years of earnings. Is that accurate? Is this a scenario where um, if you are a very high earner in your earlier years and you probably have regressed in terms mm -hmm. of salary, is it a scenario where you really need to come and check to ensure that you're getting or you're going to get what you think you're going to get? That's an interesting question, actually. Uh, yes and no. The pension, for most people, they earn more to the tail end of their careers as opposed to the earlier years. So you begin, you've left Sir Afro, you left wherever, you enter as a, as a clerk. Eventually you become a manager, you earn, you earn more. As such, once you earn more, you contribute more. Yes. So to, to answer your question, however, no, it is not exactly right. So we use the best five years of your contributions, wherever it is. So it can be at the beginning of your career, or it can be at the end of the career. The best five years, wherever they are, whether it's, one in, whether it's 79, whether it's 80, whether it's 2015, wherever they are, we use the best five years to calculate that average which I spoke of, and these are the figures that are used to calculate your pension. However, every month that you contribute is important because they, they add up to the 180, which is the minimum requirement to be entitled yeah, to a pension in the first place. Earlier on, Ms. Glasgow spoke about wills and estate. And so someone may retire and receive that pension. However, that person will eventually die. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can one will the pension? No one cannot will the pension. Because NIC's legislation is quite clear. It, it's about survivorship. Survivorship is simply it's a relationship of dependency. So were you dependent? on the person who died. So the question is whether you have to be married or whether you need to be a common law. No, the legislation speaks to dependency. So if you are living with somebody for more than five years, then that's dependency. There is a relationship. You understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is a relationship between, between the two of you. You, share, you, pay the, you pay the electricity, I buy the food. So that's how the legislation speaks to survivorship. So if you die as a, as a pensioner, then your spouse, whether married or unmarried, your spouse becomes, en becomes entitled to that pension. However, what is your, who is your spouse? So in, in our own society, it's very, it's, we have a peculiar kind of society. So a man or woman, see, can be married, but he is left or she has left her husband for a number of years. And as such, she has now begun living with somebody else. So while the wife may come forward, the, the, or the legal wife may come forward, mm -hmm. in terms of determining who's the survivor, and I see looks at the relationship, the dependency. The Was the wife dependent on the pensioner? And if that relationship cannot be established, then whoever he lived with, whoever cared for him, whoever he shared a household with, that's the person who becomes entitled. Very interesting points of discussion. Uh, hold that thought. Mm -hmm. We do for a break. Uh, we'll continue the discussion when we get back. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. The that no. they do. Think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. 
Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rye St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. And uh, welcome back. Uh, again, we are discussing part two or three part series on retirement planning and let's just get straight into back into the discussion uh, we have a representative from Nagico insurances here uh, mrs henville uh, mrs henville when um, people get to the age of retirement obviously there are certain things that become of paramount concern um, people want to know how they could save up monies um, can they maintain the insurance premiums? Uh, because, I mean, we all know that what NIC does is give you a contribution. It right. may not be enough, as Mr. Bernadine said, for you to maintain the standard of living that you were once used to. Um, people tend to fall back on insurance, especially in the, in the area of medical insurance, when, as you know, the older you get, sometimes your health begins um, to wane. Uh, what are some of the ways that, um, you know, somebody who is coming up on retirement um, can deal with the insurance companies to ensure that, you know, they maintain good levels of premiums, they, main, they maintain their coverage, you know, etc. We have scenarios where people are part of group medical insurances and upon retirement that, that goes out the window. What, what are some of the ways that people can? Luckily, help? there's magical. <laughs> <laughs> and what we offer, what, what we offer right now, we do offer retirees covers for persons we have insured. So acceptance age is 18 to 60. So at propo as proposal stages, we accept those persons, right? Going into retirement, you will not have any trouble because we already put the retirement benefits and the retirement premium in that proposal mm -hmm. that's already accepted by the business person. So you have retirees cover. So it's an easy transition into going to the, the retirement stage where you get certain benefits. Um, we do offer that. Um, luckily also, when persons are retired and they, they pass, say they pass and they have a family that they have to take care of, and we have that coverage where the dependent spouse would automatically be the primary insured. So your spouse passed, he was 65, mm -hmm. and there's a spouse, there, there's a, the dependent spouse. We do not say, okay, I know you're sick and okay, the primary insured passed, your husband passed. We no longer want you. This person become the primary insured at Nagico. So they just need to maintain the premiums? They need to maintain the premiums. Once you're 65 and you're paying your premiums again, and once you have retirement cover, we do keep you on the plan. There's, there's coverage for you. And we do not limit them to say, okay, you cannot get this because you're retired. The, the benefits are the same for a retiree or uh, persons uh, um, below 65 years. Mm -hmm. Some people, uh, myself for example, would choose to become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, that would be their, their retirement plan, um, simply because a business has the ability to generate revenues even after you physically stop working. Um, uh, from a standpoint of in, uh, protecting an investment of that nature, um, you look at business insurance. Um, what would you advise somebody who is an entrepreneur, a current entrepreneur, or somebody seeking to venture into, you know, being a business owner um, from a standpoint of business insurance and, you know, being sure that they're covered even after they get to the retirement age? Yeah, um, we, we offer small group plans, um, minimum persons four and maximum ten as a small group. So we do offer that for small business owners. Um, the same age range between 18 to age 60, we still offer that same, but, but it'll be l um, lower premiums because you know, a person just starting on, maybe we do not have much money, the salary is not too high. But so the, the premiums are a little lower than our normal group comprehensive plans. Mm -hmm. What about providing insurance for the business itself? Um, if I'm retired, I now have staff working for me. I, I, I'm probably concerned about, you know, somebody um, being a bit shady 
Um, um, is there so, any sort of insurance coverage for scenarios like that? Or, or, or probably just fire catches at my business place, what have you. I mean, it is my retirement plan, so how, how can I protect that? Yeah, we do, we do offer that. Um, unfortunately, I cannot give so much information, but if you do, you call Nagico. We, we offer different types of policies. Mm -hmm. um, how do um, you find so yourself? Actually, as a business owner, mm -hmm. I do have contents insurance. Uh, and yeah, we I'm do very sell. interested in your insurance uh -huh. for the, the uh, businesses as well, for individuals in there. So we'll need to talk afterwards. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you, from a standpoint of law, Ms. Glasgow, how do you manage you know, the, the, the varying scenarios? Because um, you may have somebody who has no will, Mm -hmm. um, who has uh, beneficiaries listed on their private insurance plan, mm -hmm. um, but they may have a spouse, etc., listed at NIC. How do you manage, um, you know, somebody who has passed, and how do you deal with, you know, their assets? Well, okay. So that we're talking about this. Is they've passed away, and a family members perhaps come in and indicated. Well, we'll ask for various documents. Um, this is going to become a court matter, and we're going to do letters of administration uh, so that we can find out uh, as much as we can about the individual who passed away, if they have any relatives who were, that didn't, weren't on, say, the uh, insurance, their life insurance, if they had life insurance. So we have to have a holistic picture of the individual, particularly if it wasn't a client of yours, um, and be able to proceed to court with all that information. So, uh, I mean, for clients of mine, I always indicate, because I do a lot of divorces, I indicate to them that if they have a will, that once a divorce is finalized, they need to do their will again because that actually negates the will and a lot of people don't realize that. So you can just rip your will off the moment your divorce is finalized because it, the law provides that it's no longer valid. Mm -hmm. So once your marital status changes, this is very important to know that. So um, if you have a lawyer, your lawyer will always advise you, look, you need to make a will. For those who don't have a lawyer who just didn't get around to doing it, it was, oh, I'll, when I retire, then I'll do a will. I would really encourage them not to do that. My own dad said to me, I did my will when I was 35. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he had his three daughters by then. He didn't have his grandson, but he's made provisions for that. Um, so you need to act, be actively involved and think through what you're doing. Obviously, if your assets change substantially between 35 and, I won't say my dad's age, but <laughs> <laughs> older, um, or you, now you have a grandson, you may need to revisit your will because perhaps you want to leave something to your grandson who was not born at the time when you made your will at 35. Yeah. So these are the sorts of scenarios we look at. We look at the, the individual client and tailor our advice to suit them. All right, very interesting discussions. <laughs> Time is already upon us. The time goes by so quickly. I guess we were having a lot of fun <laughs> on the program. Um, but I've noticed one common theme with all of you when you've spoken, um, that the time for retirement planning is now. Yes. It's yes. not about the waiting until you get to um, 50 or 55 in the case if you're a civil servant, etc. The time for planning is now. It, it puts you at a more advantageous position. It allows you to make adjustments when your life situation changes. And um, um, all of you have basically encouraged people to start as early as possible in terms of you know, getting um, their premiums sorted, mm -hmm. ensuring that they're on track with their NIC benefits. Mm -hmm. And of course, in terms of you know, leaving a last will and testament. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much um, for joining us on the panel today. Um, hopefully, um, you guys at home can join us when part three of the series uh, rolls around on retirement planning. All right, Ms. Trudy Glasgow, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Mr. Thank Bernadine, you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's that a very good point. Start planning for your retirement. Plan now and for make me, your golden know, years golden. I Come, know, let's make it happen. I know. I know.